Can we get started? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, let's get started. I love what you're about to go to, and I don't want to do it without it officially being started, okay? Okay. Right. okay. So we, so hi, everybody. I, I'm back to doing another Creative Courage chat, and today I have an old friend of mine. Some, we used to work together many, many, many years ago, ages ago. I think I didn't even have this. I know I didn't have this much gray. Uh, and I was joking that she looks exactly the same as she did back then, but I could, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it's, it's totally, and, and you see, there you go. Now you know how this is going to go. Um, and we already started talking too early about some really good stuff and she's very eloquent. She's very talented. She's, she's, she's a very prolific writer. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking to her. This is Nikki Igbo. She is the uh, feature features editor at uh, Radiant Health Magazine. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes. So once upon a time, I lived in Las Vegas, Nevada, um, and that's and I worked with Imagine, the Alex, who's our creative director, and you probably have accumulated many more titles since then. Well, I'm partner, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then um, I moved to Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, I think it's it's interesting to note there that I'm I'm originally from Northern California. But I spent some time going to school in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I also spent some time going to school in Los Angeles. And th before moving back up to Northern California, then moving to Las Vegas, and then moving to a Atlanta. And I've, I think I might stay here, depending, since I've bought a house recently here. Um, so I was just beginning to tell you, I live out in Powder Springs, Georgia, which is, um, which is within Metro Atlanta. Mm -hmm. But it's so far removed from the center and the energy of Atlanta. Like I, I can walk down the street and um, you just see farm animals. <laughs> you know, there's, there's cows, there's goats, there's a flock of geese that regularly um, come through the neighborhood. There's wild turkeys. Um, I mean, it's so achingly picturesque. <laughs> like uh, achingly. <laughs> Yes, it's just, <laughs> it's just like, this really exists. I thought this only existed in an artist's rendering yeah. of the South. But I took a picture a couple of weeks ago walking down the street, and there's this, this big, I mean, I'm on an acre myself, but there are like these big uh, parcels of land with multiple acres. And there's this tractor sitting there. It's red, you know, it's... <laughs> And then a tire swing, and it's so... <laughs> hey, Norman Rockwell. Uh, yes. Is, uh... Yes, that's where I live. And thank God for that. But also, like, it's so amazing that all these different types of Americas coexist. And I've seen plenty of them in all the places where I've lived. And I'm just like, if you guys would just talk to each other and share your individual stories about what your reality is, we could probably see that we're not all that different and then we can begin to solve this. And I think I see the beginnings of that going on here and now, um, which is why I'm not mad at the protesting, the rioting or the looting or the, uh, I'm not even mad at the roiling and energy that Donald Trump is creating. Because sometimes, <laughs> I mean, we've been moving along in this non-direction for so long, just maintaining status quo, that I'm sorry, I guess, uh, kneeling at a football game or, you know, marching on Washington 50, 11 times, you know, um, it didn't do it, but this did. A pandemic did. Um, stressed out people did. A failing economy did. And then finally, murders happened. And we were all at home paying attention to this. Mm -hmm. It's not like we had anywhere to escape to. So finally, we all got to face this because this is a do or die moment. This is a do or die moment for our country, for our future, for your daughter, for my sons. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, I would just recommend everyone take a trip if, when, if, if and when we are able to travel to Washington, D.C., you know, when it's safe to do that, mm -hmm. 
go to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Yes, yes. And the history is laid out there. It's interactive. It's it's overwhelming how much information is out there and how much of the most important narratives of American history have been left out of the textbooks that probably you studied when you went to school here, you know, and I studied and everyone we know who studied American textbooks, you know, history books. One of the things I wanted to talk to you about or ask you about, now we're jumping right into this, you know, I wanted to talk uh, somewhat of, uh, of what your work and the things that you're doing in that beautiful magazine you just showed me um, of the work that you're doing. And I think we should, we should show some of that, but there, people need to, there's a lack of, I think a real lack of, un, of understanding and empathy. And how do you see, cause people, people are, 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 are assuming a lot of things like, you know, I, I thought it was interesting that, you know, Oh, well, burning buildings, how does that solve this problem? You know, and there's these questions out there that are, that are odd because I think there's a lack of understanding of the reasons people are angry. You think it's obvious. I mean, if you're someone who is being oppressed and being, it's obvious to you why, how angry people are. But when people don't have that, all they see is the stuff, the reaction, and they react to the reaction of a thing as opposed to thinking of the thing. Am I making any sense? Well, as I was saying, like, I would encourage everyone to visit this museum because okay. it lays out the story, and that's what's missing. There is a lack of knowledge about what the full, complete American experience was, not just for white people, not just for descendants of the colonists, you know, or immigrants that came over from Europe, you know, it's, and then just the notion that the only African Americans that have been over in America were the ones that, that, uh, that were brought here. That's not true at all. I mean, there's, there's been this, this whole fairy tale um, about like us, like we were just sitting there in Africa, in our own business, braiding each other's hair, you know, eating like cassava and fufu and gari and, you know, and doing the dancing thing with beads and stuff like that. No, we were world traders too. And sure. one thing that's pointed out at the museum is like, it goes back to the 1400s, you know, because those were the earliest records that Europeans were keeping sure. about their travels to Africa. But we were trading and traveling and had these sea routes and we were sailors too. We know how to swim. You know, all of that was going on. <laughs> So, so it's like, people need to read history and right. just finally accept what's been spoon fed to you in the classroom, you know, go and be curious and seek the information out for yourself. And it's, it is there. And I think that if people really start to realize the depth, the breadth uh, of how racism was started, why it was created, because it is a construct. There's no such thing as being black. There is no such thing as being white. You should recognize that my skin color is different from you. Don't be colorblind. I actually do have black skin. It's not a bad thing. Right. Whatever ideas you have in your head associated with the word black, work that out with your nearest therapist. <laughs> there you go. Just like blackness is a construct, so is whiteness. There's no such thing as being white. It's also a social construct. It just benefits white people, you know, but it doesn't actually really exist. You just happen to have fairer skin and different features. So you have to care for yourself in a different way. What, what do you mean it doesn't exist though? Because, because, because that we are, <laughs> that isn't that part of the problem. I mean, is the perceptions that are caused because of that, because it's something on the surface. White culture. It's what a, is white culture? What right. is white ethnicity? <laughs> what is that? You're asking me. Yeah, what is it? I don't know anything. That's why I'm talking to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're stopping, uh, no. stopping me because you're just like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, hold okay. on. Okay, no, but no, I'm just asking to explain because of the fact that, see, the, the, I think that, you know, my showing of my ignorance is done on purpose so that you can enlighten me a little bit on this. But, but, but I'm talking about, because it is something that is really ingrained right now. I mean, when I say white privilege, that's a thing. I mean, that is a real thing, right? I mean, white privilege is a thing, but it's based on a social construct that 
doesn't actually exist. Like, there's no scientific basis for blackness or whiteness. Like, it's all made up. We're just human. Hey, you're talking science and, sure. Yeah, right. we just I mean, the, the, the I just chromosomes, have... uh, there's, no, there's no visible difference in our, in our, in our DNA. I mean, hardly. There's, not, there, there's any. We're exactly the same. You and I are stru structurally, we're made of the same stuff. We have some chemical differences, seriously. It's, right. it's down to that. We have some slight chemical differences. That's it. It's my skin darker than yours and my hair curlier than yours and vice versa. That's it. There is no, there's no such thing as racial groups. <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> okay. Well, so, so the, this, cause, because that is a huge part of the discussion and, a, mm -hmm. and a people, I mean, it, it, I mean, you're saying it's not, and I, and I totally understand what you're saying where you're, well, okay. I, I, I say, I understand, I accept it, but I struggle with the fact that just saying that, is, I'm not sure. I mean, it's it's good. It's fine. But I'm not sure if it's people are able to wrap their minds because it's something that's so prevalent. So what do you do about something that is so, so huge? You know, it's, it's such a big and, and, and also the guilt that the people that are fighting for uh, Black Lives Matter, there's white people that are there. They're they are dealing with some of them are because they know it's wrong and they feel bad about it and they're feeling guilty about it and that guilt is important i think it's it's because it's 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 coming from a place of empathy that is is good because it it helps us along it helps support a better cause going forward now i don't know if that has anything to do with what you just said but it it, it made me go <laughs> towards there it made me it, it pushed me in that direction so the whole white guilt thing i mean no, I'm not saying it's, I, I'm thinking, I know it's frustrating. And I know it's, I know on your, uh, from your perspective, probably frustrating. I think that it's this lack of want to feel guilt that makes people uh, stop and start blaming other things. What do y'all feel guilty about? Like, if, if you're not perpetuating racial ideas, if right. you're not, if you truly don't have any types of, of bias for people of color. Mm -hmm. And if you truly aren't benefiting off of that bias and the discrimination that has affected people of color all this time, then what do you have to feel guilty for? You know, just, just do the work so we can all get past this. But I, I think there's like, there's this video going on on the net, Jane Elliott. Uh, Jane Elliott is this famous anti-racist advocate and she had, um, she hosted a, 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 a seminar or a study classroom, I don't know. It was a bunch of white people. No one that looked like me was there. It wasn't for me. <laughs> it was for white people. And so she's white herself. And she asked them, like, okay, if you think that racism isn't a problem, if it doesn't exist, if it needs to be eradicated or whatever, or it has been eradicated, then tell me. Do you want to experience life as a black person? Do you want to be black? Everybody stand up who wants to be black. Nobody stood up. She asked, asked the question repeatedly. Nobody stood up. So there is an inherent knowledge of the disparities in treatment and experience, you know. And it's like, if you really want to make a difference, stop it. Figure out how you're benefiting from it and stop it. Or maybe it's because benefiting from it feels so good that you don't want to stop. So that's what makes it hard, <laughs> you know? Case in point, I'll give you an example. And I came to this realization after I visited Nigeria. So in Nigeria, um, it's a third world country, but it's, it's not like everyone thinks, oh, there's just a bunch of wilderness and there's no development and everybody's living in shanty towns or whatever. I saw the most beautiful mansions, the most beautiful architecture in Lagos. Like, it is just a, I mean, they're, they're building these islands. <laughs> they're making man-made islands and putting these, these mansions on them. There's so much wealth in Nigeria, but there's so much uh, wealth disparity as well. Um, so anyway, in Inugu, where I was staying, my husband and I and his in-laws and whatnot, 
we had a house girl. And she would go to the well and she would bring our water for us. And she would heat it up in the morning. So we would have a nice hot shower in the morning. Because there wasn't no indoor plumbing. There was just us and our well and our generator and the power would go out, you know. And um, so that was in Inuru, in the city. When we went to the village, though, our house girl did not come with us. And in the morning, we had to bathe with cold water. And I thought, get me back to Inugu so I can have this girl heat up my water for me because this sucks. <laughs> I thought that. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I, I um, So I can imagine, I mean, that's a few minutes. I've never had any type of servant work for me other than, you know, somebody working in a, in a hotel, you know, the maid service or... Um, a waiter. I've never had any live-in servant. I can't even pick up those guys at Home Depot, you know, that want to jump in the back of your truck when you got a bunch of, I just can't. I've never it. done that. I'm doing, I'm doing my own store shit. I never did that. I don't do that, but, but, but in not doing it, I'm not giving them work that they need to be able to feed the families and extra. You know, that oh, man, that's a systemic problem because they should be able to come over here. They should be, be able to have an immigrant worker program uh, that works that allows them to come over here and make their money or whatever because we need them as much as they need us. Exactly, exactly. Why are we tripping about so, it? So say right there, I just proved my, 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 my issues. Um, you know, so I hear you. It's so complicated, Nikki. Yeah, cause, cause, it's really not. <laughs> just stop being racist. <laughs> like if we, if we're willing to well, investigate those areas in your life. Right. So, then, so, so, so you do think, I, so, so, so this is it, this is important, because you said just stop being racist. Mm -hmm. So in my discussion with you, am I being racist in the way that I'm talking to you? In the things, in my ideas, are they racist ideas that I shared with you so far? I mean, I don't even remember what ideas you specifically shared about what you feel about what's going on. I'm, I think... Um, okay, example. You said, you said you something that I was just like, okay... Um, but then we moved on to something else. So I, I just can't remember off the top of my head, but like, well, one of me talking about, uh, white privilege and stuff like that, I think. Um, but, but the thing is, okay, example. Okay. I get, if I'm speeding, I get pulled over by a cop. It's an inconvenience. Mm -hmm. There's no fear of anything other than getting a ticket. Yeah. You don't think you're going to die. <laughs> no. Yeah. One time. I got pulled over for absolutely no reason. And I was questioned for absolutely no reason. And, uh, and in an odd way that I, I felt you? mean. Huh? Where were you? I, I, was, I was here in Henderson. I was coming up, I think it was up by my house, up here in Anthem. And I got pulled over and I was questioned and I forgot what it was. I had pizza, I went to go get pizza and, and the guy questioned me and, and his form of questioning was accusatory. And I was livid. I was like, how dare he, right? And that was like the first time that's ever happened to me in my life. And then Deb, you know, was like, what's wrong with you? That happens to like some people like every freaking day, you know? So there, that, you know, I, I don't think I'm, I'm a racist person, but I have this, this, this idea of how things should be based on how I experience the world. And then other people yeah. have their view of how things should be based on how they experience the world. Now, right now is a time when we have to try to understand the way the other person's living because they're the ones being killed in the streets. They're the ones being like murdered. And on our end, there's a knee jerk reaction from a lot of people saying, well, he had to have done something. He had to have done something to deserve that. And there's nothing, nothing that could, he could have done to deserve what, he did, what happened. I think that's the whole point I'm trying to make. You know, it, it is the point that I make every year when on my website, I have a blog. Um, I blog every What's the website? Um, Thewritinggoddess.com, or you can just Google Nikki Igbo, N-I-K-K-I-I-G-B-O. I'm the only person with that name. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic name. Okay. Yeah, and then, yeah. And then it'll, be, it'll be right under your name, so I'll make sure everybody knows to go there. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry um, to interrupt. So actually, like this tradition of blogging, it started at Imagine. It started with, you know, Black History Month. I noticed like, okay, no one's going to do anything. I'm going to have to do this. So it was my way, like I started by sending little um, 
bits of information about something pertaining to black history. I emailed it to all of you, whether you wanted it or not, because I included it with, um, remember we, we sent each other like what our schedule was for the week? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I just included it with that. I'm like, look, whoever wants to read it, they'll read it. If they don't want to read it, they won't read it. But um, my whole point was, you need to know who I am and where I ca- came from. Sure. The, the, the more that you know about me, maybe the better of a chance I have of being treated like a human, you know? Mm-hmm. And this is for people you consider your good friends or your enemies. Like, if you really want to know my story, there's a wealth of information out there, like already, from Phyllis Wheatley, you know, to um, uh, James Weldon Johnson and James Baldwin, Maya Angelou. I was just listening to her earlier. Mm-hmm. You know, um, just all of these writers out there that have been telling our story. There's a wealth of information online. Go through all this history of what we've created. Like, a black man created a potato chip, <laughs> you know? Um, there's, we have contributed so much to the fabric of this country, and people don't know that, you know? And I'd be willing to think that, at least for me, when I know who somebody is, I'm just like, okay, okay, I see you, you know? I think that's what we need to do first. In learning the story of black people, um, I think it really is going to play, play a big role in not being racist anymore. <laughs> You know, right. it, it just, no, I agree with you a thousand percent. I think you're, yeah, that's, that's you, the most important thing is to, yeah, so is like, to educate yourself. Whatever is preventing people from reading a magazine that has a black person on the cover mm-hmm. or picking up a book that's written by a black person or going into a restaurant that's owned by a black person where they serve traditional foods prepared by black people, whether that comes from the Caribbean or the American South or Africa you know, Nigeria, Madagascar, Kenya, you know, all of these different experiences, like, do it. What's it going to hurt you? You know, I've had, (laughs) I've been exposed to so many different types of, of foods, and it's just only made my experience and appreciation of the world better, you know? It's the world through food. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Like, food, if you think about food, food is an art, you know, Finding all of these different ingredients together and then making this, like, yum, you know, that's awesome. And then, you know, all the things that I mentioned, uh, the artists that I mentioned in the books, their poetry, it's art, you know. The picture behind me, it's art. And it's my way of telling you who I am. Right. So you'll cut out all this stupid stuff. It's just dumb. It's a waste of time. It's not helping anybody. You know, so I think the biggest hurdle to get over is like, oh, why am I going to watch Insecure on HBO? Like, those people don't look like me and they don't sound like me and I don't have anything in common with them. Like, that's what y'all have to work on. <laughs> that, that's pretty much because I know Toby Keith, you know, I listen to, I, I don't think he's the best musician ever, but he sure is a good coach on The Voice. Um, what's his name? Bl- Blake Sheldon? Like Sheldon, okay. Yeah, I like Toby Keith a lot better. You know, I I belong no, to. I, I don't watch that show, but I know what you're saying. Yeah, you know, like we we listen to the things that you create and really appreciate them. I belong to this musicology group um, on Facebook, and we just swap information about different music, different eras, and everything. And it's so awesome. Like we were really like having a good time talking about Sting. You know, and the fact that he produced all these black and white music videos during a certain era, especially that one with the stalker song, like, dude, what was going on? (laughs) No, but it's funny because when I talk to young artists, and a lot of times they're musicians, one of the things I always ask them, I said, well, who's your favorite artist? And they'll tell me. And I'll say, well, who's their favorite artist? And sometimes they won't know. And I say, well, you got to figure out who their favorite artist is. And then when you find out who that is, listen to it. And then start getting exposed to who inspired them. And eventually mm-hmm. you go down this chain and you always end up to Robert Johnson. You know, <laughs> at the end of the day, it's crossroads. It's all about the, it's all about the blues. It all comes back to that. It, it literally does mm-hmm. in music, all of it. 
eventually comes down to the blues, the roots, the roots of, of, of great rock and roll music and all the music that we listen to now. And you have to educate yourself and it's this process of educating and it exposes you to so many different kinds of things. And even in the lyrics and stuff, music is a really important way to learn things. And I was exposed. It's funny that you brought up food because Joe Strummer is one of my favorite artists. He's a punk rock king from the ages from London. And he, he wrote a song um, about, it was all about two guys meeting and one guy's asking him about mushy peas. You know where I can get some mushy peas? And then the guy's saying, well, what, do you, what, what, do you, what are those? I don't understand what those. He goes, well, have you ever tried this? And you ever tried this? And it's all world food from all over different parts of the world. And they start throwing back and forth different foods from all part of the world. And it was his way of showing we can, we, you know, food, using food to show that there's differences in beauty and, and something to experience through just talking about foods. And there's talking about empanadas and he's talking about all these, he said electric empanadas, but I don't even know what that is. But, um, but it was interesting because then I wanted to go out and find what each one was. And I did research on all the different foods and what parts of the world. Anyway, that just taps back because I can't help it to the creative side. You're mentioning, um, uh, books and things like that. And I know that you're, you're an editor and, and everything and you held up before we started one of your books. Can you uh, talk about it? Talk about your work a little bit? Sure. Tell us a little bit yeah, so I'm the features editor for Radiant Health Magazine and we are a biannual coffee table publication produced right here in Atlanta. The editor in chief is Dr. Nina Makanjwala. She's of Nigerian descent and um, this magazine is just all about promoting health and wellness in every way imaginable, like holistic health and wellness for members of the African diaspora. Um, so she was inspired to create this publication because her father had um, a heart transplant. I think he, if he was not the first African, he was one of the first Africans to have a heart transplant. Mm. And because he traveled back and forth between Nigeria and the States, well, all the information that's available about um, healthy dieting and healthy eating as it pertains to heart health has to do with a very American or Western focused diet, you know, and um, the environment and exercise. Well, things are different in, in Africa, in Nigeria, you know, the environment's a little bit different. Food is a little bit different. The way food prepared is, uh, the way food, food is prepared there is different. So she was wondering, it's like, well, are there any publications out there? Are there any like encyclopedias that I can look up that translates these health, you know, um, this health advice to the African experience? There wasn't. So she decided to create one. And this is what this magazine is all about. Well, it's so, a beautiful magazine. Can you go, if you go to the website, I'm sure there's a lot of samples of, this, of, the, of the book and stuff like that. And you mm -hmm. can see, I'm sure. Yeah, because you're holding it up, but I want people to actually see, because I can tell it's, it's, it's a gorgeous book. I want to I I probably yeah. edit it into this while you're talking about it. I think that would be kind of cool. So it's radianthealthmag.com. That's what, where we are located online. And cover, um, you know, just to see, because it's like, well, Health, what does that mean? So we cover healthy eating. Um, we have a feature section, which, well, let me go back. Every magazine is themed. Okay. So this one is the rebirth issue. So all of the, the articles have something to do with the idea of renewal, rebirth, rejuvenation, you know, um, recreating oneself, you know. Um, so we have style, culture, fitness, health and wellness, beauty, and then body, body of mind. So do you, where, where do you get your, call, your articles and, and articles from? Are they from all over or they, do you have a team of writers? Where, where, where do they come from? So I'm the features editor. We have, um, we have like a diehard five-person team <laughs> producing this magazine. Hard-working team trying to get this thing out. How often does it come out? I'm sorry. Twice a year. Okay. And like very content heavy so this was they're regularly like 180 pages mm -hmm. and it's not ads like i mean we're not mademoiselle we're not vogue these There's are full page photographs and and yes. it's it's it, it's it's definitely it's almost like an artifact to have in your home you know yes and, and the fact that it's twice a year says a lot too i think that's a lot of work's probably gone into it Yes, we put a lot of work into it, but we're a dedicated small team. We have contributors. Um, you know, we have maybe like two full-time staff writers. 
you know, including myself. And again, like we're working moms, like Nina has two sons, um, school age. I have two toddlers. My boys are two and four, um, four years old going on. Well, the younger one is going on 52, I swear. The older one, he'll be turning five. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, so we're working moms and we're creating this. And this is, this is really a labor of love because we really want to showcase our stories. You know, we want to showcase our stories. We want to, um, we want to provide resources for our community, you know, globally. And we want to share information with each other because we're not even communicating with each other on a certain extent to like what experiences we have. So there's, there's somewhat of a disconnect between Caribbeans and African Americans. We don't really know the South American story, you know, like Charuga. Yeah, Bamba, you know, I have, that's messed up, but I won't do that, <laughs> you know. And well, yeah, uh, like I said, the story of the Charuga people is, is a terrible story. I mean, mm -hmm. horrible in Uruguay, where my family's from. Um, mm -hmm. But um, anyway, sorry. Um, yeah. When did, so when did the, go ahead. Sorry. So, yeah, we are continuing that tradition of storytelling, and I regularly interview about six, five, between five and six luminaries for each publication. So um, this is Lovia Ajayi. She's a, um, you might have heard of her before, but she's, she does social commentary. Talked to her a couple of years ago. Great That's a great, great cover. This is uh, Ro, uh, Roz. I didn't interview her, but she is one of the, um, the journalists for the, the Warriors. Hmm. Um, so she follows them around and she covers Warriors basketball. She's amazing. She's a woman of Nigerian descent. I've mm -hmm. got, I've got a, like, like just about maybe seven minutes left of on my usual thing I'm doing on this thing. And one of the things I want to see if, if you'd be okay with me asking you is for you, you found out, you found the, the, the secret way to make a career out of something you love to do. You found a way to, um, fulfill yourself and in, 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 in your career, you know, doing your things the way you want to do them in art, using your art, using your creativity to do it for young people out there that want to do this. They say, I want to, I want to do that too. Is there some advice you can give young people out there on how to pursue it or what to expect if they are pursuing it? My mother um, told me constantly while growing up, anything worth doing is worth doing well. And the best way that you can do something as well as you possibly can is to never stop learning about it. So if it's something that you really want to do, then constantly absorb all the information you can about it. Um, get a mentor and ask them how they do what they do. You know, um, surround yourself with people who also want to do that, do that, you know, and help each other um, because what I find, especially with a lot of creatives, is, is, if, is if you and your friend are on this creative path, whether that's in, in comedy or in writing or, you know, in, in music or in painting, whatever you create, um, when you go along with a friend, it's like you have somebody at your back and they're looking at what's happening and you're looking at the way and you come together and you pull your resources and then you just pull each other up. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, educate yourself and don't do it alone. You know, find a friend to do it with you, you know, or find your tribe and connect with them because they'll, they'll lift you up and they'll keep you going, you know, but that's, never stop running. That's fantastic. So I've, I've kind of come to, I think I've just decided listening to you to say that, that I've been saying this a couple of times in the last few interviews that, hey, kids, that's a rewind moment. I know it's dating me from the 80s because it's tape. And I don't think they know what rewind means. But I think I'm, I'm, I'm discovering during some of these talks that there's these rewind moments. You know what I'm saying, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that was it. I think what you just said was, was really important. So anybody that wants to be an artist, this is the time to go back and listen to what Nikki just said. Go back to where I, right after I said that question, listen to what she said again because there's jewels in there to listen to and to follow. So anyway, you're great. Thank you so much for taking the time and talking to me today. That's really great. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Great.